What's up, everybody? It's your boy, your host with the most. And I'm bringing another book. Same book. It says on Japan, from Japan. Ihon no Kokoro. And the secret. Be part three of the series. Keep on going every day. Finish this book. Let me get the timer going. We'll commence the cold reading. In the development of their own culture, the Japanese have borrowed many things from the advanced cultures of the Asian continent. Japan was, however, protected from the possibility of a sudden large influx foreign culture might obliterate its indigenous traditions and culture by the fact that the distance between Japan and the continent prevented, movement, prevented any mass movement of people back and forth. The rulers of Japan were however able to send envoys across on sturdy ships and were thus and were thus able to selectively introduce the continental culture. Throughout history, Japanese rulers have had a monopoly on the introduction of foreign ideas, which more often than not they use to reinforce their authority. Buddhism was no exception. At the time, Buddhism was first introduced by the rulers of Japan were attempting to establish a centralized government modeled on the governmental system of China. They brought in and applied principles of Chinese government as well as the philosophical and cultural concepts on which it was based. While they introduced Buddhism as a separate channel for the introduction of foreign civilization, and built Buddhist temples to serve as centers of foreign culture. In Buddhist temples, there were many priests trained in the art of managing and applying the introduced knowledge and information. The priests were under the protection of the state and were strictly prohibited from engaging in any kind of missionary activities among the people. Although the rulers conducted most government ceremonies in accordance with Shinto, they also frequently had the Buddhist priests carry out Buddhistic ceremonies similar to those of Shinto. In Shinto, spirits are believed to inhabit the land. Therefore, in the building of Buddhist temples, due respect had to be paid to the land of the spirits. These spirits were defied, were deified. And, after a temple had been built, the local deity was worshipped as its guardian. It was also necessary to obtain the consent of the Shinto mountain deities in order to procure the lumber and other materials required for the building of the temple. Buddhism, therefore, was able to gain acceptance among the Japanese only by establishing and maintaining friendly relations with the many indigenous deities. Eventually, it came to be taught that the guardian deities were reincarnations of Buddha enshrined at the temples and that their, therefore to pray to these deities was the same as praying to Buddha. As the power of the state began to decline from around the 10th century, some priests began spreading Buddhism, Buddhist techniques, Buddhist teachings among the common people and the Buddhist view of this world and of life slowly found its way into the thinking of the Japanese people. Indigenous Shinto beliefs, however, were not eradicated by the spread of Buddhism. Rather, Buddhism was absorbed side by side with Shinto and the two religions became harmoniously interwoven in the lives of the people. Then, in about the 15th century, the Buddhist temples began actively to promote rites for the dead in this way accelerating the general acceptance of Buddhist beliefs. 
The rituals for the ancestral spirits became closely tied in with Buddhism, and through Buddhism, there was established a system of ceremonies for the dead and souls that began with funeral services and continued long after death. In this way, Japanese have come to accept Shinto and Buddhism as being complementary to one another. They pray to the Shinto gods about things concerning this world and to Buddha about things concerning afterlife. In their relation with the Shinto spirits, the Japanese feel that they must be totally sincere and pure of heart, honesty and purity being fundamental teachings of Shinto. This in turn has provided a basis for the Japanese sense of beauty. Their feeling that the natural state is the purest and that any changes made by man spoil the, nat the natural purity. As these Shinto beliefs came to be overlaid with Buddhism, the Japanese began to see the complex art artificiality of worldly life as merely a bother. Then, through the acceptance of the Buddhistic view of the impermanence of all human affairs, they found a way to reckon with their unfulfilled worldly desires. Buddhism, with its deep concern about life after death, teaches to be assured of rebirth in paradise. To avoid damnation, one must not sin. Japanese Buddhists, moreover, adopted a belief that no matter how sinful a person has been, he will nevertheless be saved if only he repents his sins and prays to Buddha. As a result, although Japanese have an awareness of sin, they seldom live in continuing fear of the consequences of their sins. For the Japanese, mercy and gentleness are the basic teachings of Buddhism. Most of the Buddhist ceremonies in which Japanese participate are modifications of Shinto rites related to ancestor worship. Still, there is no denying the fact that Buddhism, through its subtle influence on Shinto beliefs, which are fundamentally premised on an acceptance of this world, has done much to enrich the spiritual life of the Japanese. Right, we're in the uh, the next chapter, and it says the Constitution of Seventeen Articles and the Spirit of Law. And we get a, an image. And it says five-story pagoda at Oryuji Temple, Nara, where Prince Shotoku is enshrined. Built in 607, the temple which he founded is the world's oldest wooden edifice in existence today, courtesy of. Taka Kono. Pretty cool. According to the Nihon Shoki, Japan's oldest historical record, the Constitution of 17 Articles was written by Crown Prince Shotoku in the 12th year of the reign of Empress Suiko, 604 AD. The Constitution of 17 Articles is not only a key to the thought of Prince Shotoku himself, but also a key to understanding Japan. Prince Shotoku virtually shaped the Japanese nation himself. In the days, the prince ruled as regent. Japan had a caste system much like that of India, the station of every person fixed for life. Although born the son of an emperor, Kotoku strove to emancipate the people from this castle system, this caste system, and by strengthening the imperial system to establish a centralized constitutional government. Kotoku's ideas are expressed through his constitution, as expressed through his constitution, were, however, too far ahead of the time he lived, times he lived in, and this isolated him intellectually. Tragically, 21 years after his death, not a single member of Prince of the Prince Shotoku's family remained alive. The downfall of the prince's family, however, proved to be the beginning. 
of the acceptance of his ideals. In the course of the Taika Reformation 645, Emperor Tenji and Fujiwara Kamatari began introducing the principles advocated by Shotoku, albeit in modified form. Their descendants, particularly Emperor Tenji's daughter, Empress Genmei, and her daughter, Empress Gensho, and Kamatari's son, Fuhito, completed the process. The Constitution of 17 Articles was closely related to the system of 12 ranks of nobility established by Shotoku a year earlier in 603. A system which designed, which designated rank in accordance with five virtues derived from Confucianism and which was intended to provide, provide the basis for a bureaucratic government. It has some interesting aspects. Then we have a, an image of Prince Shotoku from 573 to 621 who shaped Japan with the constitution of 17 article courtesy of Ichi Joji Temple yeah uh, Mike Sand y'all this has been old readings with gotcha gotcha will be back tomorrow more cold reading gotcha yeah matinee thank you for watching